well, let us worship God. We join together in the greeting that is printed in your bulletin. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. She goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Welcome to our time of worship today. As always, it is good that you are here. Please notice in your bulletin the calendar of upcoming events. The Women's Bible Fellowship meets tomorrow uh, at 10. On a Tuesday, we have our brown bag lunch and uh, midweek Bible study beginning at 11.30 in the morning. And then that night, uh, we have a uh, charge conference gathering and the officers of the church are encouraged to be present for that. On the 6th, uh, the United Methodist men will have their monthly breakfast. And, uh, all the men of the church are invited to be a part of that. Look on down a uh, few slots on the 17th. Uh, we will have our uh, fellowship dinner. And you see a reservation uh, blank in your bulletin that you can use to make sure there's a plate for you. And uh, there may be some other tales uh, coming up before long, but I hope that you'll put that on your calendar. Um, I believe that catches us up. So again, welcome. Please stand and join in our hymn of praise. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. You'll find it in the Methodist hymnal on page 128. <coughs>
declaration of faith is printed in your bulletin. Let us say that which we truly believe, saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. together and if you will uh, in the course of that prayer share names or uh, concerns we will take a few moments to consider each petition individually uh, then after each one I will say Lord in your mercy and if you will please respond hear our prayer and I just remind the people in the back that the choir wants to hear you I remind the choir that them folks want to hear you so let's pray. Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Jay Barco Stanley. Lord, in your mercy. In your mercy. Danny Roberts. Lord, in your mercy. In your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Kimberly and Warren and Howard. Lord, in your mercy. Lane Camp. Lord, in your mercy. Claire Campbell. Lord, in your mercy. Our superintendent, Dan Camp. Lord, in your mercy. And our Bishop, Bill McAlilly. Lord, in your mercy. 
Keith Carlson. Lord, in your mercy, and our great church, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, O Lord, turn your ear to us, grant us your peace. We ask these things in the name of the risen Christ. And now it is with the confidence of the children of God that we are bold to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And we continue worshiping as we receive this morning's offering. Today's first lesson comes from the book of Acts, the second chapter, beginning with verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon every one, 
because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And the day, and day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Here is the reading from the Acts. The reading from the Gospel comes from the book of John, the 10th chapter, beginning with verse 1. Let us stand for the reading of the Gospel. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run away from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved, and will come in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I uh, had occasion this week to be involved in at least three conversations with various folks where the subject of what they call devotions came up. Daily devotions, I guess they were saying. And uh, don't hear me say that I have anything at all against such practices. I think we probably need a little more of that in our lives and in our churches. But you know me, rather than the meaning, the sentiment, I got caught up in the word. Because that word, devotion, is one that we use all the time, and we've got sort of a, a arm's length uh, definition of it. But uh, if we were pressed, we might have a little trouble saying much about it. We, we could talk all around it, but you know, it's just one of those words that uh, that we know, that we think we know, that we think we know, that we know, that we know, that we think we know. And uh, I'm just curious. I just wonder, because it's not a word, devotion, or being devoted. It's not a word that's limited to uh, daily, private prayer time. I would describe some people I know as 
being very devoted to their families. Their family, particularly their household, is, uh, is their single highest priority. They work for the health and function of the family. And whenever they are faced with choice, if one of them is family, they always, always, always choose family. So that's a kind of devotion. They are devoted to family. And you can plug just about any word into that phrase, excuse me, they are certainly devoted to their, and you could pull out family, and you could plug in friends, you could plug in work for some folks, or you could plug in hobby. I have a, an acquaintance, we don't really have a stronger relationship than that, but he probably plays golf about 350 days a year. <laughs> if it's not raining a typhoon at the moment, he's on the golf course. The little player's place where he plays, they've just given him a key to the clubhouse because it might be closed up for everybody else, but he goes out and plays at least nine just every day of the world. Now, in a vacuum, there's nothing wrong with that. I wish I was, you know, that good. But that's hardcore. You know, when you play golf in six degree weather, or 160 degree weather, that's, you've got to love chasing a little white ball. The reading from Acts uses the word devotion, actually devoted. But here, the word particularly means to hold fast. The, the people were gathered and they were devoted. They would hold fast to the apostles' preaching and the fellowship breaking of bread and of prayers. And as a definition or as a description, I kind of like that. To hold fast. Hold tightly. To refuse to let go. That's the kind of devotion that these early church members had. And it is important in a lot of places to hold fast, either spiritually or physically. Some of us were visiting before the service started, and we made note of the, oh, how shall we say, breeze outside. We said, it'd be a good day to fly a kite. And I thought back to the very first time I ever flew a kite, or actually was somebody else was flying a kite, and they let me hold the string a little bit. Well, I didn't know how hard the wind could blow, or how strongly that kite could pull, and I didn't hold fast enough. And the last we saw that kite, <laughs> It was drifting off into the distance. We never saw it again. You know, sadly, I've got another story almost just like that. I'll quit confession in a minute, but my dad and I were going fishing. Actually, dad was going fishing, and I was going rowing. But he said we were going fishing. And he had this little 
John boat, just a little two-seater flat boat, and, and the place where we were fishing was just not much more than a glorified pond. And he'd back the boat up, and he uh, was loosening up the things that secured the boat, and he, in my defense, in my defense, Dad was always saying, okay, you ready? Grab hold of the boat. And this particular day, he did not. He just let it go. And I was about from here to there in the boat, and there was nothing I could do. Now, he sort of expected me to jump in the water after jump in himself. But you couldn't have made a swimmer out of both of us put together. And so we just watched the boat on its easy little journey out yonder. We walked around the pond and eventually sort of came to shore on the other side. We got in the boat, went back across and just pulled the thing up on the trailer and went home. The joy of that day had been diminished a little bit and the fish had been jumping into the boat. It wouldn't have made much difference that day. And he never actually said anything. But there was a lot of grunting and a whole lot of silence way back home. I said, what you be doing home so early for? <laughs> and I'd have loved to bet a fly on the wall when he finally told her what happened. I think. <laughs> but from then on, when I went rowing, I was very careful to hold fast to the boat. This is language that describes gripping tightly. You would hold fast to a life preserver if your ship was going down in the middle of the ocean. And so the members of the early church, and they didn't really even call themselves church yet, the, the, the believers held fast to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and of prayer. Now, I want to tell you at this point, I've got a four-sermon revival series on this passage that is just spellbinding. <laughs> but we'd be here sundown if I started it, so I'm going to let you off the hook for now. So that rather than spending a lot of time on these individual components, the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers, I want you to kind of look at that as a whole. See what the practice of the primitive church was. Now, let me say that that's a mildly technical term, primitive church. Uh, we might call it first generation church. And you've got to remember, these people are making it up as they go along. The people in this story are historically Jews. And they know something about praying, and they know something about scripture and, and this kind of thing. But uh, in terms of putting the Jesus spin on it, they are still figuring it out. They are still struggling. And it's going to be another 20, 25 years before any of the books that we consider to be part of the New Testament 
are going to be written. We think that Paul's first Thessalonian letter was the first book written. It's going to be another 10 years after that before the first gospel is going to be written down. And so people are just working with little fragments, little bits, and, and as I say, not in a bad way. These are faithful people. These are people who have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. These are believers. <coughs> but they really are just kind of making this up as they go along. You can imagine they get together and somebody says, well, what do we do next? And a pattern began to emerge. Some of it's based on synagogue worship. Some of it includes some truly Christian elements. But think about that list, that roster. The apostles' teaching and fellowship and breaking bread and prayer. that is the pattern, if that is the sequence of events, if that is the way things are done, when you line those things up, what do you have? It sounds an awful lot like worship to me. So let's state that simply, when the church was a morning, it held fast to worship. And as I say, we could take a lot of time unpacking these very various elements, but I think perhaps to look at them as a whole is more important to us today. Worship. Now, the word worship comes from an old English word that I can only pronounce on a very good day. Uh, it is worth sight. And I say that because that er part in worship has got like an O and an E and another vowel and, a, and an inflection mark and all this, and, and you say it properly. You have to kind of look like you've eaten about three prunes. Worth sight. But it means to ascribe worth. To say that something is worthy of attention or, or whatnot in the case of religious worship and particularly Christian worship, it is to say that our God is worthy of our prayers and our praises and our thanksgiving, and so that's what we do when we gather together. We, we express our understanding of God's worthiness of our devotion. When the church came together and comes together, its primary focus its primary function is worship. Now folks do it in a variety of ways, and I'm just going to keep to Christian worship right now. Okay, I'm not talking about you know, offering sacrifices and, and, and uh, doing other things that other folks do, and they do them for very you know, legitimate purposes. I'm talking about Christian worship. time appointment, I had three churches. You think two is hard. <laughs> had three congregations. Delightful people. Every one of them. Truly were. And one of them was as Methodist a church as I have ever been around in my life. I mean, a fully robed choir full communion ritual 
first time I ever saw an Advent wreath was in this church. I mean, the list just goes on and on. I knew who John Wesley was. I mean, it's, you know, pretty good stuff. The second church was just this shy of Pentecostal. They were rambunctious. They were hand raisers. Uh, they didn't even have the Methodist hymnal in their pews. They had a, a, a song book, I would call it, that was just full of all of these, you know, joy, joy, joy things. But, you know, they were church and they were in church and they loved their church and they served their community. And it wasn't up to me to say they were doing worship wrong. And the third congregation was as three songs in a sermon Baptist as you'll ever want to see. They really didn't do anything except sing, take up the offering, hear the sermon, sing, go home. But I can't tell you they weren't church. But just as an intellectual exercise, let me challenge you to think about what kind of a sermon you would preach on the third Sunday of the month when you were in each of those congregations in the morning, 9, 10, 11. Because the focus is not the same. But, rather than to emphasize the differences, what I want to tell you is that each of these congregations were vital, worshiping communities. They had followed their own pattern for a long time, and the new preacher learned real early they weren't looking to alter that pattern a lot. But they would come together and praise and worship God. Just like these folks in the book of Acts. Now you can imagine, you know, that you can only hold fast to so much at a time. Have you ever been to the grocery store and you got home and you opened the trunk and there are the bags and you have said, well, I can probably get all these sacks in in one get this handful of little straps and you get this hand and you, you get your arm through and, and all of a sudden that short trip between the trunk and the back door looks like a marathon. And we either struggle in with the circulation cut off about half our fingers or we give in and set down part of our load and say, or maybe I'll come back to the other half. We can have a multitude of, of minor loyalties, things in which we are interested. But we can only hold fast to a few things. Maybe, maybe only one. And if all your strength and all your zeal is directed toward the worship of God, there's a lot of stuff that just kind of gets pushed off the table. If we hold fast the things that the apostles teach and the fellowship of believers and the breaking of bread and prayer, then some of those other things that perhaps one point in our lives seem to be very, very much a priority. Sort of slip down the ladder. Because in churches, I'm sad to say, in churches, I'm not talking about 
is here, church, is saying, in churches, because I've been in this a while, everybody has not always necessarily been directed toward pleasing God. There are selfish aims that take priority for some people. I had a professor in seminary. Only thing I remember out of his class. I had a professor in seminary who observed to us one day, people will find a pond small enough so that they can be a big fish. And whether that's a church as a whole, or a Sunday school class, or a committee, or just any little gathering of people, there are a lot of folks who want to have some kind of power, some kind of control over their little fiefdom, ever how great or small that it is. That becomes their driving force. That becomes that to which they hold fast. We can nitpick about insignificant Bible passages. You could create your own list. The list, sadly, is long. There are folks who just almost don't know that you come to church for worship. They see it, <clears throat> excuse me, as their own country club, their own social circle. And truth be known, on Sunday morning, they'd a lot rather be in there around the coffee pot than they would be in here. But it comes time. When everybody else comes in here, it's who they come to. <clears throat> these things, these side issues, these things that don't really even deserve to have a place on a list of what it is that Christian people are devoted to, to which Christian people are devoted, I guess I should have said. These things have no place in a flock that makes its greatest priority, its single concern, the worship of God. Now those things spread out a little bit. I mean, you know that. We kind of like to be in here and be comfortable. We didn't choose to build a picnic pavilion with wooden benches and make that the place where we come every Sunday. We like having tight walls so that heat or cool in its turn stays in. We like a comfortable place to sit. We like to have adequate lighting. We like to have a place that's got a little water hooked up. We like to have a place where we can share a meal, and, and none of that is wrong. It is all attendant to the worship of God. I've sat on some of those wooden benches, and after about the first 40, 45 minutes, worshiping God slips down my list. Getting up off that bench gets to be pretty important. And so if I've got a place where I can sit a little longer, that's okay. I mean, you could be like me and stand the whole time if you wanted to. We said last week, look at what happened when the early church, the primitive church, established this path. The church Holy Spirit was active. People lived harmoniously. And participation 
increase beyond all reasonable expectation. Now, I'm not saying this is so formulaic that if we get our worship just right, the place will explode with new people. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that our degree of devotion does have a tendency to bear fruit. And y'all, we need some fruit right now. We just do. So maybe today is the day when we can spend a little time in our own spirits and ask about that to which we are devoted. Hopefully, the answer really is the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, prayer, in a word, worship of a loving God. close out our worship time, we're going to stand and sing hymn number 407. now in peace. Be of good courage. Know that the one who calls you to devotion to his name walks beside you day by day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.